discuss a very important topic of history of English literature and that is uh, neoclassicism. Uh, this is a topic actually which is described uh, in BA third year in our university. But uh, there are many questions which are asked in various uh, competitive examinations uh, from this specific period. So this is my suggestion to all of you, those who are watching this uh, channel, that they must watch this uh, video, they will be benefited. But before you watch this uh, video lecture, this is my suggestion to you that uh, go to my other video lecture that is on periods of English literature. So that is in brief actually the, the development of uh, the, uh, you know, the periods. Actually, I started from Anglo-Saxon period and I, uh, you know, explained till uh, you know, uh, later part of the 20th century. So that is also an important video lecture. Now, uh, neoclassical uh, age. Uh, you see, uh, the time span of neoclassical uh, age is from 1660 to 1798. So this you will keep in your mind. That whenever you know uh, the question or the idea comes of neoclassical literature, so this is the time span from 1660 to 1798. Now this age uh, is called by Matthew Arnold as our excellent and indispensable 18th century. This is also uh, the age of prose and reason, and this is also called you know. Augustan age and that is why I told in the beginning that this is a very important age which I am going to discuss because this is an excellent and indispensable 18th century. Now when you say neoclassicism or neoclassical age this is from two words neo and classic. Neo means new and you know, classic refers to the style and works of the ancient writers of Greece and Rome. So when we combine these two words, neo and classic, uh, we get the meaning of neoclassicism as uh, uh, new classicism or rebirth of classicism or restoration of uh, classicism. This neoclassicism is actually uh, the moment in the history of English literature which laid emphasis on the revival of the classical spirit. Now for your kind of, uh, this I have just told you in the beginning that this uh, the time span of this period is from 1660 to 1798 and for your convenience you can understand it, um, you know, when I divide it into three, four parts, then you can easily understand it, that uh, we have the Restoration Age from 1660 to 1700, then we have uh, the Age of Pope or the Augustan Age from, 17, from 1700 to 1744 or 45. Then we have uh, the age of Johnson or the age of sensibility from 1745 to 1798. And then we have the age, the, the traditional age from 1740 to 1798. So you have to keep in your mind these four parts, then you can understand it. A restoration age is a separate age. This you, you must study separately. Similarly, we have the age of hope from 1700. To 1744. We call it the age of Pope because Pope played a very important role or Pope was the leading figure of that particular time from 1700 to 1744. Now uh, you see uh, these uh, you know, writers of the neoclassical era they tried to uh, imitate uh, the style of you know Romans and Greeks. And you know, imitation is always an imitation, it cannot be original. 
because that was a kind of slavish imitation of the ancient Greeks. And that is why sometimes this neoclassical age is also called pseudo-classical age. Pseudo means false, because it was basically an, uh, an imitation. Now, uh, this was also an era of enlightenment, uh, which emphasized on logic and reason. This particular age, that is neoclassical age, was preceded by the Renaissance and followed by the Romantic era. I have just told you this, the Renaissance and the Romantic era, because you will keep in mind that there are certain points of Renaissance which are criticized by neoclassical writers. And when you study the Romantic era, then you will find out that how Romantic writers criticize the neoclassical writers. So this particular age was preceded by the Renaissance and followed by the uh, Romantic era. Uh, and I told you that uh, this particular era ended with the publication of the Lyrical Ballads, a joint venture of uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, uh, Lyrical Ballads, which was published in 1798. And this is actually the starting point of the Romantic era and the ending point of the Neoclassical era. Now, uh, this Neoclassicism is uh, is a prototype of classicism. Writers of this period uh, immensely endeavored to follow the footpaths of uh, the writers of the period of Augustus, who was the emperor of uh, Rome. And uh, you know, this particular time produced the unparalleled writers like Horace, Virgil, and Ovid. Now, this, uh, I have just told you that this age was also called Augustan age. This is after the name of uh, Augustus, Augustus Caesar, uh, who came to power after the assassination of uh, Julius Caesar in 44 BC. It was the golden period of the Roman Empire. Now, uh, this was the age of you know, reason, the age of Pope. The age of you know Dryden, uh, you know, 17th century uh, and 18th century neoclassicism was, in a sense, a resurgence of uh, classical taste and sensibility, but it was not identical of classicism. It was in part a reaction to the bold egocentrism of the uh, Renaissance that saw man as larger than uh, life. The, neoclassic the neoclassicists uh, directed their uh, attention to a, a smaller, uh, you know, uh, scaled concept of man uh, as an individual within a larger, you know, social uh, context. And they all, they, they considered uh, man as dualistic or flawed and uh, there is the need of the, the need to be curbed by reason and uh, decorum uh, and meaning is that uh, it is a direct opposition to renaissance attitude where man was seen as basically you know good the neoclassical writers portrayed man as inherently flawed they emphasized on restraint self control and common sense now, this neoclassical age was uh, the time of, uh, uh, you know, comfort, comfortableness in English. People would meet at uh, coffee houses uh, to chat their uh, politics and, you know, some other topics. They started, you know, uh, uh, the fashion of uh, drinking, you know, a beverage made of chocolate. From that very time, uh, we have the fashion of the afternoon tea. We have also the uh, you know, starting point of the middle class, the rise of the middle class, and that is why the rise of the literacy also. Now, uh, people in this particular age were very much interested in appearances, but not you know, necessarily in being genuine. Women and men uh, commonly wore wigs, and being clever and you know witty 
who was in Vogue, uh, having good manners and uh, doing the right thing, particularly in public, was essential. It was a time uh, of British political upheaval as eight monarchs took the throne. When you read the history of this period, you will find out how monarchs were, you know, changing. Uh, Charles I, Richard, uh, Charles I, Charles II, you know, all these, you know, changes took place. Now, uh, in the Restoration Age, the Restoration Age is also part of this, uh, uh, you know, neoclassical age. In poetry, the classical forms of, you know, heroic couplet and the ode became popular. Uh, as you know that uh, theatres were closed and then uh, with the starting of Restoration Age, theatres uh, were reopened and, uh, you know, plays the, the writers started writing the, the, the plays. We have Milton's, you know, Paradise Lost, which was written during this period, and we have also John Bunyan's, you know, Pilgrim's Progress. Now, uh, we have certain important, uh, you know, uh, lines of heroic couplet by Alexander Pope. One line, uh, for example, is uh, which is spoken by uh, Alexander Pope. Uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread or we get the line the proper study of mankind is man or uh, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing or to error is human to forgive divine so we have these important lines of heroic couplet uh, from you know Alexander uh, you know Pope now in Augustan age we have also the rise of you know generalism and uh, we have also the periodical essays which were you know, written during uh, this period. We have uh, 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 the, uh, the age of Johnson, which was dominated by uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson. Uh, his uh, famous work is the Dictionary of the English Language, which was published in 1744, and uh, uh, which was published between 1745 to 55. Uh, we have also the Comedy of Manners, which was written during the Restoration Age. We have Etheridge, for example. We have William Congreve uh, uh, no, writing uh, 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 during this period. We have also some important, uh, uh, you know, uh, poems like The Rape of the Rock, which was published in 1712 and 14 by Alexander Pope, the best example of uh, social satire and mock epic. We have now this particular age uh, is remarkable for uh, you know uh, you know the literature which was written during this period uh, was mostly you know comic and uh, satiric and uh, uh, we have also the pre-romantics writing during this period that is those uh, poets who sowed the seeds of romanticism for which romanticism actually culminated in form of the lyrical ballads in 1798. In this particular age also we have uh, the birth of the novel, the publication of Pamela or Virtue Rewarded by Samuel Richardson in 1740. Uh, the, the credit goes to the uh, 18th century. Now when we come to the important uh, features of a neoclassical age, the, what are the important features? So the first and the most important feature is rationalism now it rationalism is an important feature of the neoclassical era neoclassical poetry uh, neoclassical uh, poets viewed reason as the main spring of learning knowledge and inspiration for their poetry uh, this neoclassical uh, poetry is a reaction against the uh, renaissance style of poetry it is a unique, you know, outcome of you know, intellect, not of fancy and imagination. Because if you study uh, uh, Renaissance poetry, especially the Elizabethan poetry, then you'll find out the abundant use of fancy, imagination, inspiration, etc. Unlike, you know, romantic poetry, which is entirely the result of uh, sentiments of the poet, neoclassical poetry is is, is a stimulated fabricated 
and a stereotypical you know type of poetry in in uh, romantic poetry sentiments play uh, a vital role but in neoclassical poetry uh, we have the uh, we have the emphasis on wit uh, reason intellect uh, and all that uh, we 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 uh, you must have studied the poetry of wordsworth and coleridge in the poetry of wordsworth and coleridge uh, we find that how they are guided by the impulse of the imagination even wordsworth say the poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful imagination now these poets uh, laid emphasis on a reason to uh, uh, the, these new classical poets laid emphasis on reason to compose poetry uh, they disregarded imagination emotions feelings in their poetry uh, and that is why sometimes the poetry is also uh, treated as artificial and synthetic now second important point which we have in uh, the poetry of neoclassical writers is uh, scholarly allusions. Allusions are the examples from the scholarly writers. Now these uh, poets, these writers made extensive use of allusions from the great uh, writers. Uh, now taking examples from the masters from the great writers, by taking the examples from the great masters, they wanted to show that they are as great as the classical uh, writers. Read only one example. Uh, you'll find out that when you read The Rape of the Law or some other you know, uh, text from this particular period, you'll find out the examples from Horace, from Ovid, from Homer, from Virgil. So uh, scholarly allusions become uh, an important feature of the neoclassical poetry. Now, uh, because you know most of you if you are a BA student so maybe uh, I mean uh, if you're opting English as your subject at PG level so uh, you will uh, surely uh, study the rape of the law there you will find out these examples the next important quality is didacticism didacticism is an important uh, quality of the neoclassical uh, poetry now uh, you see uh, romantic poets loved to compose poetry just for the sake of poetry like you know John Keats. Uh, they uh, romantic poets actually uh, kept aside the morality and didacticism in their poetry. The uh, first and the foremost purpose of these poets was to give uh, uh, went to their you know feelings. On the other hand, if we find the neoclassical writers, we find that they laid emphasis on didactic purpose of the poetry, moralizing. Uh, they wrote satire, and through the satire, they are giving one lesson, one uh, no, preaching uh, to the to the humanity. Now, uh, uh, the entire neoclassical poetry is replete with you know didactic uh, elements. If you uh, study Essay on Men, for example, you'll find out how didactic, you know, uh, purpose is there, or the rape of the law. There are many points which are in the form of, you know, uh, preaching to the uh, humanity. Next is realism, or the realistic poetry of the society. Uh, we take only one example, that is of Alexander Pope, then you'll find out how realistically he tried to depict the 18th century society. When you read the rape of the law, we find out the artificiality of the time, uh, very well uh, depicted in that particular, uh, you know, text. Now, or read uh, Dryden's Aurangzeb, for example, you will find out that how uh, realism uh, becomes an important part of their uh, poetry. Next is slavish imitation of the ancients. Now, these neoclassical writers uh, are known for slavishly imitating the classical writers. Now, they have not produced anything original because they were trying to imitate the classical writers and that is why, as I told you in the, in the opening part of my lecture, that you know this age is also called a pseudo-classical age, false, pseudo-false. They tried to you know uh, adhere to the uh, classical writers. Now, uh, these, uh, the neoclassical writers like Dryden, Pope, Swift, Johnson, they believed that, you know, excellence 
and perfection in the literary art can be attained by imitating the Roman writers of antiquity. So the, the, the basic purpose, the basic task of these writers must be to copy uh, the models of perfection and excellence. So they try to adhere to the classical uh, rules. They try to uh, slavishly imitate the, uh, the, the classical uh, writers. Now, uh, uh, they uh, imitated uh, the classical writers and uh, you just look at this Pope's line uh, couplet where he says that those rules of old discovered, not devised, our nature is still, but nature methodized. There's a line uh, is a, by Alexander Pope. Now, um, when we come to the concept of nature in a neoclassical age, neoclassical uh, poetry, now, when we talk about nature, we always uh, remember the Romantic Age, Wordsworth and the other Romantic writers. But by nature, uh, neoclassical writers never meant the, the, the forest nature, the flowers and the, the, the beautiful plants and all that. Nature means the general nature of, uh, general human nature. The general human nature was not what the ordinary man and uh, you know woman uh, felt and thought, but the standard views of human nature as held by uh, Homer and Horace. So this is again uh, uh, you know, important point which we find in Neoclassical era. Then comes to uh, then then. Another important feature is the concept of man. What is the concept of man? The neoclassical uh, literature considers man, I told you in the beginning of my lecture, that you know, uh, they reacted against the renaissance notion of you know, man. The neoclassical uh, uh, literature considered man as you know, limited being, having limited you know, power. A larger number of you know satires and uh, the literary works of the period attack the man for his you know pride and advise him to remain uh, content with the limited power of knowledge. Now, uh, in this particular age, we have a stress on wit, reason, and common sense. This is again an important feature of uh, the neoclassical era. A stress on wit reason and common sense. Next important feature is the use of heroic couplet. In neoclassical era, we have the use of only two lined stanza form that is called heroic couplet. When you read, for example, the rape of the law, you'll find out that this is written in uh, heroic couplet. Next important point is focus on urban life. Now, neoclassical uh, poetry laid a stress on uh, town life. It is also called town poetry sometimes, the urban life, the city life. The characters are not drawn from, you know, village life. And that is why, you know, you find out the romantic poetry reacted against the neoclassical poetry. Uh, again, this particular kind of, you know, idea and romantic poetry became the poetry of the rural life. And Wordsworth says a humble and rustic life is chosen. So, uh, neoclassical poetry uh, laid emphasis, um, laid focus on town life. The characters are also from the town life, from the city life. The, uh, the setting is also uh, of the town. Only one prominent example is the rape of the lock, where the central character is a sophisticated uh, urban character called, you know, Melinda. Then, uh, next, and the last, which I think uh, the important feature of the neoclassical is the use of poetic diction. Now, poetic diction, simple uh, words, is the language of poetry. But you know, when we use when we use the word poetic diction in the context of 18th century, then we always say that you know a language which is highly ornamental, highly stilted, highly beautified. So in 18th century, the language used by the poets was highly ornamental, highly stilted. They're very fond of using figurative metaphorical and stilted language. Uh, now, uh, 
you know, romantic poets reacted against this use of poetry diction, and that is why in the poetry of William Wordsworth we have the, uh, the common language, the language of the common people, marked by you know simplicity and uh, lucidity. So this again is an important feature of use of poetry diction. So um, a new classical age, we have the ra we have rationalism, we have uh, you know adherence to the classical rules, slavish imitation of the ancients. We have the use of poetic diction. We have a focus on the urban life. We have uh, use of heroic couplet. We have histories and wit, uh, reason, and common sense. We have didacticism. We have satire. So all these points you just keep in your mind, and uh, if it is possible, I'll uh, upload uh, one more video on the representative authors of the neoclassical era. Thank you very much.